Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another year of We Watched a Thing. First episode for the year. How you doing, Toph? I'm well. I'm yeah? well. Looking forward to the year. Yeah? What, what are you most looking forward to this year, film-wise? <sighs> um, oh, episode nine. Episode nine? Yeah. More than Endgame? More than what? Avengers Endgame. Oh, oh God, please. You don't, you don't give a toss? No, I could not give a shit. <laughs> well, episode nine is until December, is it? Yep. It's a long way to wait. It, it is. Ooh. <laughs> what about your good self, Billy? Oh, I'm looking forward to lots of things, actually. I'm looking forward to Captain Marvel, i got to say. Probably more than Endgame, I think. Yeah. And, and of course, episode nine, as, as you do. As well. But does. you know what I'm really looking forward to? Not really movie, but Game of Thrones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I've been waiting a long time. Yes. <laughs> just veering away from movies. Yeah, I'm kind of gagging for it. Yeah. We, we just watched. You say that. <laughs> we just watched. Um. We just watched seasons one to seven again just recently. Yeah. Like, just- and I and I do say again. <laughs> <laughs> well, but why would you do it just now? Are you going to do it again in like April leading up to season nine? There's a very, eight? there's a very real chance. Yeah. <laughs> But what did we watch this week, my friend? We got to one of my most anticipated films of 2018. Yes. Which would be Yorgos Lanthimos' new film, The Favourite. Yes. Now, even though this episode is coming out after our top five, we are recording before so that we don't know if this is in our top five yet. True fact. But the listeners the, know already. <laughs> the magic of podcasting. <laughs> so, I know you were very much anticipating this. What did you think? Let's Hit me straight with it before we even get into cast or anything. I haven't seen Dogtooth, but of the Yorgos Lanthimos films I have seen, this is my favourite. The favourite is your favourite. You could say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The favourite, as we said, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos and written by Deborah Davis and Tony McNamara. It stars Olivia Colman, Emma Stone, Rachel Weiss, Nicholas Holt, Joe Alwyn, James Smith and Mark Gatiss. And it, and it is your favourite, you say? My favourite, Yorgos. Interesting. My favourite flavour of Yorgos. <laughs> is that is that a play on the fact that it sounds kind of like yogurt? Yeah, and he's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, I did not know what to expect coming into this movie. This is by far and away his most accessible film. Certainly, this is this doesn't this barely feels like a Yogos film. Would you agree with that? Yeah, was, I I can't. I should have checked this. Um, did he write? Killing, he, killing the Sacred Deer and I, Lobster? Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because when I walked into this movie, I went with two of my good friends who well, none of the three of us had any idea what to expect. But I said to them, look, just so you know, this guy makes weird movies. It's probably going to be pretty weird. Walk in there and by a long stretch, we are the youngest people in the cinema. Yeah, right. Everyone in the cinema, 60 plus. And I'm sitting there looking around going, you guys have no idea what's up. And I was expecting walkouts. I was like, 20 minutes in, half these old people are going to be leaving. I was the one in the dark because this was a straight period piece. Those old people had it right. This this was this was a period piece through and through. Straight is a is a stretch. It had some art house twists to it, but I think structurally, it was it was a pretty it was it was just a period a dramatic period piece. I was expecting a lot more weirdness to come out. They say a lot more than one would expect. They do. There's a bit of language, you know, and there's there's obviously quite a few sexual themes and stuff, which you don't get in many period pieces, but it's it's all played quite straight. Would you agree with that? I think straight period piece, I think seriously stuffy. Yeah, right. So you, th- you think like Downton Abbey? I've not seen it, but yes. <laughs> or like uh, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. You think that very yeah. kind of traditional- which This is not. It's 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 not exactly, but it's it's closer to that than it is to a Yogos film, despite being a Yogos film. Yeah, so by definition. Yeah, <laughs> I think let let's start with the highs of the highs. The acting in this film is phenomenal. Holy crap! When the weakest performance in your lead cast comes from Emma Stone, who is a marvelous actress, you know you're onto something good. I was trying to think. It, it occurred to me during the film as well. I was f- sitting there because I like sports obsessed I feel a need to rank things. Yeah. And so I was even during the film I was figuring out who your MVP is. Who who where, where do these three sit on the podium yeah. of this film? And I agree with you. I would have Stone in third. Yes. Who would you have in first? St- and and 
Stone is fantastic. She's, she's fantastic. Everyone in this film is fantastic. Even the small supporting performances are so good in this film. But for me, best on ground is Olivia Colman as Queen Anne. Olivia Colman may well be my favourite performance of 2018. I agree. She should win. Un- she should win supporting actress for this film. And this is going to be interesting because all signs point to them putting her up in lead. Which oh, I would not call her the lead. We, in this I agree film. with you. Yeah. I completely agree. I and think I she don't is, think she'd win at lead. She's a very strong supporting character. Yes. Like it's not like, you know, Dame Judy winning for five minutes in yeah. Shakespeare and Love. She's like, not the old broad in, to- in Titanic. Yeah, yeah. But certainly Lady Sarah and Abigail are carry oh, the story more than more they, than she does. And yeah. I th- and I think she would, if she was put up in supporting actress. She'd waltz away with it. Yeah. This is definitely his most Oscar-worthy and Oscar-baity, like, film, I think. This is right up the Oscars alley, being a period piece. And Well, it remains to be seen, I think, because from from what I've heard, I remember this, this film played really well at, the, uh, at a film festival in New York and didn't play as well on the West Coast, is what I've heard. So- Right. I don't know. It depends on whether the Academy members fit more into that crowd that was like, well, that was kind of weird, or if they're like the the East Coast elitists who were yeah. like, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, Olivia Coleman, best female performance of the year. She was outstanding. Rachel Weiss was also wonderful. Emma Stone was still great, but, man, Olivia Coleman was so strong. The amount that Coleman can do in scenes in this film where she's actually doing very little, but yeah. the amount that she can convey while doing almost nothing yeah. is amazing. You know that that scene where there's the there's the dance going on and she sat there in the wheelchair, yes, and the camera's just on her for kind of ten seconds yeah. before just she. What, you can see the jealousy in her face. <laughs> yeah, before she just snaps and says, "Get me out of here." Yeah, and I was at that point, I was like, "Give her an Oscar, <laughs> give her an Oscar right now." Now, do you know much about Queen Anne? Are you up with your British history? It will shock you to hear I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I did some googling. It seems that this may be a mostly true story. Well, certainly it at least borrows from. From real events. Yes, yeah. there was, of course, yes, Queen Anne was real. And yes, there was a Lady Sarah. Yep. And she did leave a memoir that was scathing yes. of Queen Anne. How much of that's true and how much is that her being pissed off? Yeah. Who knows? Some interesting things. I do find it very, not odd, but it's an interesting choice that you never even meet Queen Anne's husband in this film, who was very much alive at the time. They did have an active relationship, given how many miscarriages she was having up until this point. And yet he's not a character in the film in any capacity. Yeah, right. It's like, well, I I probably still assume that for the purposes of the film, he's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Which is funny. They just never mention him. But in historical sense, he was very much alive. They were still a couple. I just find it very interesting. An interesting choice to really focus on, you know, the female relationships in the film and just completely discard that. Mm. I think it was a wise choice, to be honest, because there's a lot of characters already- vying for the film's attention. Yeah. So I think it was a wise choice to to not really focus on him. The scene between Stone and Coleman when Queen Anne's telling Abigail about the miscarriages. Yeah. Oh my god. That's and that's when you kind of first go I think because I really like the the way in which Queen Anne is kind of unpackaged during the film where she starts off being this kind of you're just like, oh god, really? Like you're the just the most childish, idiotic person ever. And yeah. But then as you get deeper into it, and these scars are bad, and you figure out yes. why she's like this way. Oh, I Olivia Coleman's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I really liked the way that the film was structured in in the way that the characters are developed, the the way you learn things about them, and you know whether you're actually told things outright about them or whether it's just through very brief conversations they have. You know, like I, lo- yeah, the, the big reveal of the all those miscarriages is is about the rabbits, about why she has so many pet rabbits, and and it. It sheds light on earlier scenes, for example, where you see Sarah kind of being a bitch about the rabbits. And yet, you know, there's such this draw from Anne to Sarah that she kind of, yeah, she is like a child in some ways. Yep. Yeah. It's such a great screenplay. And, and the unpackaging of both Abigail and Lady Sarah is great as well, because to begin with, when Abigail turns up, you know, she's fallen in the mud. She was stuck in a carriage with a guy who was 
given his old fella a tug. <laughs> yeah. And, like, your, your sympathies are with Abigail. Yes. And Sarah really does seem like a bitch. <laughs> yeah. And then as the film develops, like, by the time Abigail is in favour- yeah. And she's got nothing to do with it. She was just now she's just there getting drunk. Whereas it turned out that there was a point to Sarah's manipulation yeah. of Anne. And you're like, ah, oh, hmm, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's an interesting film because there kind of is no real protagonist or antagonist as such. And even by the end of the film, you're kind of sitting there going, firstly, I don't even know who I feel did win. And I don't even know who I wanted to win in the end. Because you do, you are kind of built with that feeling that Abigail is who we're following. She's the one who is new to the setting and we kind of come into that environment with her. So typically, that's what you do with your kind of hero character. But by the end, you're like, wow, wow. (laughs) And it is interesting because you don't know whether you want her to succeed or not. My, I mean, ultimately, my sympathies lie with Queen Anne, though, because she has gout. <laughs> yeah, much like yourself. Yeah, my heart, my heart was bleeding for her when she was like, when she like, she's struggling along with the crutches, and Sarah's like, "Oh, come on, just walk." And I was like, "She can't, she can't just walk." <laughs> now, how often do you lay there in bed and demand that your poor girlfriend massage your legs for hours? <laughs> I've never tried that one. I don't think I'd get far. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's the terrible thing about gout is that. A, no one believes how painful it is. Yeah. And B, it's self-inflicted. <laughs> and also, you're not a queen. So. <laughs> That's true. Massage your own damn legs and stop yeah. drinking. <laughs> I, might, um, I might rub some herbs on it <laughs> yeah. next time. But okay, okay, for anyone who doesn't believe how much pain Queen Anne was in, let me just tell you this. I have ruptured the ligaments in my right ankle and I've had gout in my left ankle. And given the choice- I would take the ruptured ligaments. Wow. It Gout is the pits. <laughs> but again, no one cares because it's self-inflicted. All you got to do is stop drinking, isn't it? See, it's unavoidable. <laughs> <laughs> I did think of you during the film at one point. Did you? Did when, someone mention food? <laughs> when Queen Anne was smashing back cake like it was going out of fashion, <laughs> vomits in a bucket, and then goes back for more cake. <laughs> Oh, that was a great scene. And then, and then you see her walking the hallway still with kind of vomit and cake all over her face, possibly hours later. Classic Billy. I've like, been there. <laughs> Get up the next drive through. You're all good. Um, can we talk camera for a second? I would love to, because for me, that was what felt like a Yogos film more than anything. The camera work and the direction in the film is really what separated this from your majority of period pieces for me. Such interesting camera work. Huge. Wi- We've spoken about wide lens the last two weeks. This had enormously wide lenses, like true fish eyes. Yeah, yeah. So basically the entire, I mean, there would be, I can't think of a single shot in this film that would be shot on even a medium length lens. No, I, I think I think the, the longest lens used would have been like a 22. Yeah. And I, re- I really like a lot of the wide angle stuff. I think it works for me particularly- because it makes camera movement more mm. dynamic. And I think there's some really good setups in terms of camera movement. The You mentioned before the fisheye stuff yes, where, you, where those- you can really see the distortion yeah. in and the lens and Particularly they happen inside corridors and stuff yeah. when people are walking or riding carriages. That doesn't really work for me because uh, as a rule, and I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, but as a rule, I don't like it when- the shot draws attention to itself. Because it's so unlike anything the human eye could actually see. Yeah. So I was sitting there noticing the distortion in the lens and I'm like, I shouldn't be I shouldn't be looking at distortion in the lens. I should yeah. be watching the story. I was wondering if for those shots whether you know, that was one of those things for me where obviously the the use of wide lenses and things like, you know, a lot of shots are very low angles, lots of looking up, a lot of headroom in shots. I think a lot of that stuff is obviously intentional. The fish eyes for me, I was wondering whether that was kind of a matter of circumstance because it did look like they were filming on real locations. And I was like, I wonder if this really is a narrow hallway and they need to use a lens this wide to actually get the shot. I remember hearing- an interesting thing from a couple of years ago when there was this um, cinematographer's roundtable thing that I was watching when I probably should have been working. And it was the year that Room came out. 
Right. And I haven't the, seen Room. And the cinematographer for Room was there and they were talking to him about like the first half. I haven't seen it either, actually, but like the first half of the film, which is in a room. The room. Yeah. And they were saying they were asking him how did he go really wide with the lenses so that you could because you'd need to to be able to see anything. Yeah, in a real and, room. And yeah. he said that actually no, they tended to go at about like fifty mil, a kind of standard sort of lens, because then you can't take in the whole thing. So it really does become really claustrophobic. Yeah, right. So and I thought, oh, yeah, because, like, y- your brain does go to use a really wide-angle lens because you're in a-, a tight space. Yeah. But if you do want to evoke that claustrophobia, then actually, no, mm. you make it so that you can't see. That makes sense. And I think I would have preferred that. But the fish eyes did really seem to be on shots of, for example, carriages in hallways and stuff where they obviously seemed to want to follow the carriage, which- yeah, mm. I was wondering whether that was a matter of circumstance, but I, I'm with you. I would have rather not had them. One thing, one thing I really like about the look of the film is we're used to in any any period piece. We've seen a lot of really atmospheric nighttime shots. Yep. Oftentimes they're really, really good looking shots, but that skips over the fact that at the time, with a bunch of with just candles, yeah, it would be dark as fuck. Yeah. And this got sh- leaned into that. Yeah, where like they're walking along corridors and stuff just with candles in hand and you can't see a fucking thing. Yeah, or that great scene in the library where Emma Stone first sees Sarah and Queen Anne together and which just blows the candle out as they open the door. Yeah. yeah, some really great use of natural looking lighting, at least in this film, whether or not it was truly natural. But what was your, t- we spoke about it briefly, but how did you feel about the very low angles and lots of headroom and stuff? It was another one of the things that just visually separates you from Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. And to to me, that was the biggest difference. Like the way it's shot and and even to an extent the way it's constructed in kind of the, the multiple parts as such, almost like acts of a play. Uh, what did you, skipping to the last page, what did you think of the the very ending of the film? Oh, we, we're going straight to the ending now. Oh, we can jump back. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan of the ending. Same. The, the end, That kind of final shots where, you know, you see Emma Stone's face and she's kind of realising, did I really win? <laughs> like, And especially when you think about her history where she was sold for a gambling debt and forced into prostitution. And there's that earlier scene where she's talking to Anne about how that made her feel worthless. And I think- I think she's realising in that final scene that she's exactly back there, that she's really just Anne's sex toy. In in the same scene, you then go to Anne, whose mind then goes to, and you've got that crossfade with With the rabbits, rabbits, thinking about the fact that now she's stuck with Abigail, having sent Sarah away, and yet another one of these loved things that she's lost from her life. And I was like, this is great. This film- Ending it miserably yeah. was, I think, completely the right thing to do because the well, whole the There whole is thing, no happy ending. That's right. The whole thing's set in this, like, venomous yeah. snake pit. Yeah. It, it feels- It's not quite a revenge story because there's no revenge, but it has that real feeling to it where it's just so venomous. And the whole thing is about this power struggle, but, like, for what? <laughs> now, I know it's boring to, to praise a period piece for costumes- but the costumes in this film are so bloody good. Yeah, like, they're pretty great. Don't like I could just watch Rachel Weiss walk around in <laughs> in in breeches for hours. Yeah, but you, you could watch Rachel Weiss do anything <laughs> for hours and you'd be happy. This is true. Bird. <laughs> <laughs> she just looks so fucking cool. Yeah. And like the develop when you see the progression of uh, Abigail's clothes as well when obviously she arrives and she's poor, she's destitute, and then you you slowly see her progress up to a lady again, and the clothes are changing almost every scene. Yeah, I I think it's very well done. Mm. One of my favourite scenes of the year in this film, guy getting tomatoes pelted at him. (laughs) Didn't he look so happy? He was into it, wasn't he? It's such a weird scene, because at first you're like, is is this meant to be a torture thing? Because I've got this guy who looks pretty much like Chris Farley <laughs> dancing around holding his junk with the biggest smile on his face. <laughs> you know who you know who I thought it was for a second is um, I can't remember his name now. The guy who voiced Peter Rabbit. Oh, James Corden. <laughs> yeah. For a second, I thought it was him. <laughs> I could see that, but he looked so happy. He just looked joyful. As yeah. Was, is that is that like was that a game back well, then? From what I understand. 
those that weird shit like the racing of ducks inside and yeah, throwing yeah. and throwing, oh, I loved those little elements too. and throwing tomatoes like apparently that stuff those specific things might not have happened but people got up to some weird shit <laughs> people with too much money and too much time on their hands well who, I mean no TV <laughs> yeah, no Nintendos no, what else no, are you gonna do none of it <laughs> just pelt some tomatoes I mean sometimes at work I just throw stuff at you that's true <laughs> <laughs> It's true. When you got an event and you're rolling up the gaffer at the end, you pelted at someone. <laughs> You'd be mad not to. <laughs> Let's talk about the score. Very interesting score in this film. It was scored by the same person who did Killing of a Sacred Deer, Johnny Burns. I actually thought it was the same score at times. Right. Which is very interesting because two completely different movies. Obviously, you've got a lot of the, the classical music pieces which play. But a lot of the original score is just kind of droney and kind of violin screeches, almost like a horror movie. Like, dun, dun. When it was that kind of screechy violin, I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. I I feel like it worked, but I kind of don't know why. Like, it was, it was interesting and different to have something, you know, to have a period piece that wasn't just your typical, you know, kind of John Williams-ish type score was nice. And it really set this kind of vicious tone for the film, which I liked. So, scoring then, what are you going with? I'm pretty thoroughly on board with this movie. I'm an 8 out of 10. So, can I make a prediction? I mean, obviously, our listeners already know. Is this in your top five of the year? Yes. It is. It's just not in mine. Right. It's just. But it's a very, very good film. I liked it a lot. It's also an 8 for me. We could have had Beth on this week and heard her talk about a film that she actually liked <laughs> for, for once. Um, she reckons it's her favourite of the year. This is definitely my favourite Yorgos film. And like I said, it's his most accessible. I think pretty much anybody could watch this movie. Sure, they, they dropped the <laughs> bomb. And, <laughs> you know, you got a, you got a guy whacking off in a carriage. You, you know, but it's good family fun. <laughs> <laughs> you got Queen Anne going crazy and- Yelling at people? Yeah, it's like Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Nice. I, I thought you would. I'm yeah. glad you did. I know that you were anticipating it. I, yeah, I was I was certainly hoping to really, really be into this film. Yeah, certainly. I think, I think just for the performances alone, yeah. this film is worth the ticket. I think, like I said, when the weakest in your cast is Emma Stone, you know yeah. you've got a good thing because yeah. she's fantastic. We haven't, well, like, we haven't actually talked that much about Rachel Weisz. She's- she is fantastic. She really is. Which is a shock to precisely nobody. Yeah. How do you think Emma Stone went holding the British accent? Um, I'm always kind of loath to judge when it's not my accent, but I did. Because you're not as good as Im- at impressions as I am, so you're not kind of used to that. Chortle, chortle, yes. Yes. Um, I did read a review from a British publication which said, which was praising her accent. So yeah, I was right. like, okay, I-, I will assume it was excellent then. I had I an English guy once ask me what part of England I'm from. <laughs> True story. Might have just been looking at your face. You look very British. He was, um, are you saying that Cabbage Patch Dolls look British? <laughs> <laughs> you look a lot like Tim from The Office. So. <laughs> In fact, I've had, th- I've had three English people ask me what part of England I'm from. Really? Yeah. Like true English people. Genuine in the flesh poms. Two of them were hammered. <laughs> They're like, whereabouts are you from? I was like, Wagga Wagga, you dickhead. <laughs> Could not be more Aussie. Wagga Wagga. <laughs> Although it's very un-Australian to call it Wagga Wagga. You just call it Wagga. Wagga. Yeah. Because if you can do something quicker in Australia, <laughs> yeah. you do it. <laughs> All righty. Well, what are we getting to do next week? Next week, we're jumping into reverse slash- Modern times. <laughs> when was Mary Poppins? In the 60s. Yeah, right. But I think it was set even earlier because it's it's about, you know, there's a lot of women's suffrage and stuff. I think it was yeah, set King George, in the 1910s. Yeah, King, King, famously, King George is on the throne. Yeah. It's in, it's in the song. So, I mean, so this film must be set in the 1910s. No, because there's a guy with mad PTSD who I'm assuming is a World War One veteran. In, in what film? In the new one? No, in Mary Poppins. You know, the, the next door neighbour with the cannon who's clearly suffering from PTSD. <laughs> Maybe that's from a different war. Yeah, it could be like, <laughs> he could have been on bloody Nelson's ship. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, how are you, are you looking forward to Mary Poppins Returns? I Look, I've heard good things. Yeah? 
I'm I'm very curious to see it. I'll be seeing it with the kid. So yeah, be good fun. That's what we're doing next week. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchthething.com or wewatchthething at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchthething. If you want to help support the show in the new year, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchthething. And in the meantime, go watch a movie. See ya.